Well, hi, everybody. This is John Jay. Thanks for joining me. I'm going to tell you a short story, true story, and uh, it, how it prompted me to uh, bring up this discussion. And so in this discussion, we're going to talk about the Private Membership Association. And we're going to talk about something called easement rights. And I'm going to show you how they're related. And I think this is really the rest of the story. Um, and I want to share with you, when it comes to the PMA, I want to share with you my concept as to how this works that a PMA is not just a document with some words on it, okay? It's actually a relationship, just like a trust is. But before I get to that, let me tell you the story. So I'm driving back, I live in Florida, I'm driving back uh, from an out-of-town trip through Georgia, near Macon, almost midnight, a few days ago. And uh, I, I see that, um, you know, the police are on the median and they're the sheriffs, they're, they're stopping people or whatever they do, you know, in the middle of the night. And there was heavy traffic actually at midnight. It was uh, just before midnight. So anyways, as I always do, I keep my, uh, my car on, uh, on cruise control. And so I'm going at 67 miles per hour exactly, right in the center, so that the passing lane's you know, on one side of me and the other lane is over here. And um, I look in my rear view mirror as I pass one of the sheriff's deputies. And I just watch, because you know, I'm kind of paranoid, like probably many of you. And so I notice the sheriff's deputy rolls on out into the uh, Interstate 75 to follow me, and uh, it, I, I guess I figured it was me. I don't know. I, but anyways, so he drives up to the blind spot to my, you know, to my uh, left, and he's there for about five minutes, and then he puts the lights on, and uh, so I, I stop and everything. So he comes over to the passenger window, and he, he's got the the light shining in my eyes and so I roll the window down about you know that much and I said can I help you with something what's the nature of the emergency how can I help you and he said oh well um, I noticed you were swerving and I just wanted to see if you're okay if you need some help or if you're maybe tired or drowsy and I said do you have evidence of that you know and so that began the conversation and he says well I'm not gonna I'm not gonna write you a ticket you seem to be alright I was just gonna give you a warning because your your tags expired and I said, well, that's interesting because uh, as you can see on the plate, on the face of the plate, it's good for two years. I just renewed it. And so yeah, my point here is that this sheriff's deputy had to make this claim that there was a public safety issue. And, and this is going to lead into what I'm going to explain here. So um, so anyways, it, it went on from there. So I said, I have to get my, I'll get my license. Uh, it's in the back. So I had to go to the back of the car, open it up, get my license out of my luggage and show him, and I, again, I showed him the tag and I said, you know, you can see that it's not expired for two years. The reason why I make that point to the officer, and I don't like to argue with police officers on the roadway because first of all, it's not even safe to be there. I mean, this was in the middle of the night. This is ridiculous that they're doing this. Um, so I'm not gonna make it worse than it is, <clears throat> but uh, I showed him again and then I, um, I asked how he was able to determine that if my tag was expired uh, you know, as I traveled past him at 67 miles per hour while he was stationary and he didn't really want to answer that question um, but he said well I'm just going to write you a warning and you might want to check with a Florida DMV to make sure uh, you can straighten this out <laughs> which there was nothing to straighten out so I'm just standing there and I you know he's got my license and he's writing up this um, uh, this warning so he said on his clipboard and I noticed he was watching me out of the corner of his eye. He's not writing. He wasn't actually writing anything. I'll show you. I'll tell you guys and this, this is funny. So anyways, he's looking to observe me because that's what police officers do. They observe and what they're trying to do is find some way to give them the cause or the right to do something else. And so, uh, of course, as he starts this casual conversation, which is never a good idea to have a casual, friendly conversation with the police. And so he, he asked me, um, are all the contents of your vehicle, is this, is this your vehicle? And, and I said, it is. And, and he would have known that had he actually run my plates, which he didn't. He said he did and, and determined that my plates were expired. So, you know, he was just trying to create a case, right? So I said, of course, uh, you know, all, everything's mine. I don't have any other people's property in my car, which, you know, if I would have said something like, oh, yeah, I got my, a box from my brother. I brought I got some gifts from my children. And I brought, you know, if, if I said something like that, maybe he might have uh, called for a canine unit to search my car or to sniff for drugs or something. And I would have been there all night and they probably would have more than likely found something. OK, and uh, taken my car or, you know, something like that. So. 
you know, I, I just said, of course, everything's there is mine. It's my car. And then uh, he asked if um, I had been drinking. And of course, I said, no, I shouldn't. I shouldn't have really answered the question. I, I should have said, uh, do you have evidence of that? You know, but anyways, and then uh, the other question, as he's pretending to write this warning, okay, he's still asking me these questions. He's trying to get, he's trying to get something from me. <clears throat> and then, uh, so he had the nerve to ask if he could search my vehicle, and I patently, I said no. And so that was the end of that, and he uh, finished writing the warning, tore off my copy, and said, drive safely, have a nice evening. He said, I said the same to him. I stuffed it in my console, my van, and I took off. And about an hour later, I stopped for fuel. And I said, I'm going to look at this thing. You know, I didn't even read it. And so I pulled this citation out, and it was blank. <laughs> he didn't write anything on there. All he was trying to do was use his position to create a case with the presumption that I was, that gave him the way in. There was a public safety issue, meaning I was swerving. And of course I was not. In fact, I knew that you know, when the cops are watching, I'm very careful to not coast. I'm, sometimes I'm lazy, you know, I, I might be fooling with the radio. I never read my phone while I'm driving, but sometimes I'm fooling with the radio and I'll coast a little bit. And so I make extra certain care that I'm not doing that. So um, anyway, so that's what happened. And so after that, I really got, got a little, uh, miffed at that and I I just I said I had enough and I, it was like at one o'clock in the morning and I called the sheriff's office uh, from my car and I said hey this thing here's what's going on here and I said <clears throat> I don't want to get anybody in trouble but I'd like to find out what moron um, set this officer on this type of detail to create a crime or generate revenue on the side of the highway when it has nothing to do with public safety <laughs> or keeping the peace or maintenance or anything like that it's just to raise revenue in the, in the person I was talking to was a corporal I think he identified himself as a corporal or something and he was laughing and he goes well um and he started giving me names and stuff and he goes here you, you know make your complaint or whatever so I wrote a letter but anyways so it got me thinking <clears throat> what do we have so this does relate to PMA so but let me let me just talk for a minute about what right did the police have how did the police get the ability to go on land or a, let's call it a public right-of-way because this is what we're dealing with here so you have a public right-of-way and the the issue is that when there's a public right-of-way everything has to be done with with safety there has to be safety and if things are unsafe well then someone has to police that and we've already chosen who that's going to be it's going to be the sheriff the police <clears throat> it's going to be some authority of that kind it's not going to be a private citizen it has to be you know, uh, someone we've designated and, and we funded them, we've, we've paid for their training and these sorts of things, okay? So <clears throat> if you'll think, uh, think about this, you have a roadway that is a public right of way. Who has the monopoly over public safety? Nobody does. But as it turns out, we have a list of police services, the sheriff, the, 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 uh, the police, the state trooper, you know, all these Department of Law Enforcement, I don't know what, it's probably different in your state slightly. So at some point, we people, we gave permission to these organizations to police public safety and important matters. I don't think we gave them permission to raise revenue or, or like what I just described, my experience there, I don't think that was part of the deal. So how is this expressed? How, how, do the, how does the sheriff, how do the police have the right to, not, they're not obstructing traffic, but they're staying on the, on the, on the public rights of way and they're, they're catching speeders and they're writing fines and things like this, right? Well, people gave them an easement. This is a shared right over the use of land, an easement. So our police have an easement. Think about your neighborhood. Now, I've lived in a neighborhood where the streets were private and the police did not have control over this uh, neighborhood. They couldn't just drive through the neighborhood whenever they wanted unless someone called them. Okay, so someone who was responsible for the neighborhood or someone who lived there um, would be able to call the police and, and have them call on the property. But, but otherwise, it was, they were private streets and we paid for them. We paid for the maintenance and everything else. The county didn't do that. The place where I'm living now, the county pays for everything. 
I mean, we, we, we pay the count, uh, we pay the county and the taxes go for that. And so the police can come on the, on our uh, streets and, and uh, do whatever, do whatever they need to do. And so let me just describe how this works. So, so the house I'm living in, the owner has dominion or property rights over the parcel of land and in and, and my house that so there's a sidewalk and then there's the apron or the tree lawn they say and there's the gutter and there's the street and there's the center of the street okay so the property rights on this property go from the back of the property in the backyard and extend all the way through the house out to the sidewalk but they also extend out to the gutter and to the center of the street so everything is private property so literally my private property from my house is actually out to the center of the street. But I have an easement right with the county, so I can't obstruct or do anything to that part of the land, although I do have a private property right over that. There's an easement with my utility, all my utilities, um, the power company, the internet provider, the cable, the water, all this stuff, case okay, sewage. Uh, and so with that easement right, I, ha I have to yield the right of way so to speak when there's someone's exercising an easement right and so just like with the police okay so on the interstate if i go further out into the beyond the street beyond the roadway the interstate the the boundary of it i'm going to run into some private property i'm probably going to run into a farm uh you 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 see this all the time when you're driving on the interstate there's farmlands and things like that it's private property it all starts with private property and then there's a shared use of the property that allows people to travel through the property without asking for permission all the time. This is the usefulness of an easement. So if someone who's been given permission to do a thing in the name of public safety, let's just say to keep things simple, it is not doing something in the name of public safety and instead is doing something else like I just described. All right. So I'm stopped by the police. That's why the first thing I ask the sheriff's deputy is, what's the nature of the emergency and how can I assist you? because he had his emergency lights on. And that's what he's supposed to be doing. He's supposed to be responding to emergencies. And if he's stopping me, well, then maybe I need to help him. Maybe he's calling for my assistance, which, you know, they, they never do that, right? But that's what they, they can do, it, you know? And so I'm legitimately asking, what is the emergency and how can I help if possible? And because the easement was given for public safety. It was not given to harass people. It was not given to make false custodial arrests because when you're stopped by the police, you know, on the roadway, this is known as a custodial arrest. You are under arrest while the police officer says you cannot leave until he's done whatever he's talking to you or whatever he's doing. All right. So this gets into um, the PMA. We And, and I'm sure this is going to generate a lot of questions, but I want to give you a broader picture of how this works. So what the heck is a PMA? Okay. It's the private membership association, it's a club, it's a family, it's a birthday party, it's a wedding reception, it's all kinds of things, okay? A PMA is a generic thing. It's a generic concept that there's a gathering of people and you're not invited. Or if you are invited, other people are not, okay? The PMA is defined by who it excludes, okay? So the PMA exists without regard to a written description. Now, certainly, if, I, if I'm if i running the YMCA, for example, now the YMCA we know is a public accommodation. It's open to everybody, okay? It's a gym, typically. It doesn't have to be. <clears throat> the YMCA can be a church. A church is, by definition, a private membership association. A family is a private membership association. You're not invited unless you are invited, okay? You're always not invited until you're invited. That's just how PMA works. And so that divests the let's call it the state is how i was explain it it divests the state of having a duty to act or a compelling interest so in the case of public safety and the use of an easement right that police officer has a an official duty and obligation to act when there is a public safety risk okay and it has to be observed he can't just you know hypothesize and he, it has to be observed it has to be concrete and that's why the the sheriff's deputy said that to me as if that was going to be enough, you know, I'm not, I'm not dumb. I mean, you guys would figure this out too. So um, anyways, I just, I, I wrote a letter to his uh, supervisor and I said, look, this is not the proper use of your easement rights. This is what I told the police officer. Um, I didn't tell the police officer at the, on the scene. What I'm doing is 
I sent a copy of the citation or the warning <laughs> that was blank. I sent that to the actual sheriff and I explained what happened and maybe they can track it back to that particular detail. But I want to let them know that I know that this is not a proper use of the easement right that was granted to the sheriff's office by us. Now, I don't live in Georgia. I'm not a Georgia resident. But speaking figuratively, we private property owners gave that right to the police. Okay, and that was that right was being abused. And so what is the remedy when you're using an easement for a purpose that was not agreed to? So that would be known as an encroachment or trespass. So there may be a cause of action for encroachment or trespass. So I know I'm hopping back and forth here, but the PMA, where a lot of us are talking about using a PMA because of the fake public health emergency, okay, the phony emergency that's been going on, um, this has to, the PMA allows you to isolate an activity. So if I'm running a business, for example, that's normally a public accommodation, I can turn it into a PMA um, by operating as a PMA. That's the first rule number one is to operate as a PMA. So if it's a hair salon or a gym, those are the easier ones. The coffee shops are a little more difficult to operate as a PMA. It's almost really, it's hard for marketing, okay? Um, and so you can have a PMA and that solves a lot of the problems and you have to operate as a PMA. Now, sometimes it helps to document the PMA. So if it's an, an actual, let's say a dental, a dental office and normally it's open to the public and now let's say it's not anymore. Let's say it operates like a gym where you have to have a code to enter the building, okay, because you're a member, you're a paying member. Well, that would help to have a written policy statement that identifies or sets forth articles about terms of how the relationship takes place, that, that private membership association, that relationship, okay? So yeah, in some cases it makes sense to have articles, but what I, what I really have a hard time with is I see uh, professionals in there, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with these documents, but I see them selling complex documents for PMAs and, and people using them that don't, that don't understand that a document doesn't save you. You actually have to act accordingly to the document. So that's the first step is to do it accordingly. And also the next step is to not only in practice whatever it is you're doing as a PMA, but also to give public notice. So for example, one of the things we would do on a business on the, on the front door would be to explain that, okay, here are the hours of operation and then after that, we would put something like by appointment only, right? Or you could identify it as a private club or a private membership association. There's all kinds of ways to let everyone know that it is no, no longer or is not now a, a public accommodation, meaning that anybody could just walk in the door like a grocery store, okay? Somewhat like a co-op. You can do that with grocery stores. Now, grocery stores, co-ops, and, and membership clubs, they are still public accommodations. They don't have to be, but that's just part of their business and marketing model. So easement rights can be encroached upon. So if I extend a right to uh, someone to come onto my property, or if I have a shared right with someone, we're gonna be very clear about that. Now, where are the easement rights expressed? This is what you guys really need to wa wanna find out. I hope you wanna find this out for yourself. What are the easement rights? I would like to know, like in the front of my house, what are the easement rights of the the um, the trash pickup, the, the the waste management? What rights did I give them? Did I give it to the county and then they're they're using that? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. But I know where they keep them, and they're public record. They're part of the property title. They're part of the deed. Go pull your property deed and see on there what easement rights are given. Now, maybe the maintenance and the police and all that may not appear on your actual deed because maybe the only thing that's going to be on there is going to be the fence line dispute that the previous owner had with the neighbor and you guys they worked it out with an easement agreement okay so maybe that's on there so easement rights are a matter of public record and they're recorded in the same place your mortgage would be recorded so that's what you want to do you get the the parcel uh, information and you go look it up. You get the, literally the address of the property or the legal description and you go look it up at your, your county tax appraiser's office or the county recorder's office where mortgages are recorded and you find out what the easement rights. And another way to do it, because it's public record, you could probably request it if you're not sure. 
you can ask the agency, what are, what are the easement rights that you have that allow you to collect the trash or whatever, okay? There's utilities, police, government agencies. Um, there's going to be a survey, okay? This is where the, you arrive at the, uh, the rights. So what can I do with this? What can, I, what can I do with knowing that there's easement rights that are creating all these situations uh, that's underlying maybe problems I might be having. I mean, a really good example would be a business that's being harassed by a government agency for the you know the phony health emergency, and uh, it's it's being harassed. So, what is what is the remedy? What what do you do? Well, what rights does the agency have? If you're going to operate as a PMA, maybe it doesn't have any rights. But here's what these guys do. Just like the police officer I was explaining to you, the sheriff's deputy, this is why I gave you this story, because what we're finding is um, government agencies just make up a, a claim that someone made a complaint. And what I'm finding is all the cases that I've looked at, um, these are employees of the agency itself who are claiming to, you know, these are the people making complaints about the business, refusing to comply with their, you know, their phony uh, health measures, right? So. What they're trying to do is create a, uh, a legal duty to act by claiming there's a public health or safety risk, just like the sheriff's deputy in my case I described to you, okay? So this is what's going on. So what happens to your PMA in that situation? Well, your PMA, if you're, if you're just stuck on the idea that it's a, a written instrument and you're good, you're good to go, uh, no, because it just takes someone to claim that there's a public health issue and that is enough to, you know, cause a, let's call it a, a breach. I don't know what, you know, the encroachment. But it may not be an encroachment at first. Maybe you have to go along with it. So just realize that there's more to it than just the documentation of a PMA. You operate like a PMA, you give public notice of the PMA, and then understand where the government agency may have the authority to still come on the premises. And this also goes toward property taxes. Someone asked me today about property taxes. Well, how, how does the state or the county have a claim on your property that requires you to pay property taxes? Well, because you're eligible or the property owner is eligible for benefits, what benefits are those? Well, one of the benefits might be the right to pay taxes, which sounds kind of silly. I, I think I've seen that in case law somewhere, but really, uh, more realistically, you're eligible for things like water hookup, cable, internet, utilities, 911 responses, things like this, you see? We just forget about all these things. These are easement rights. This is where they come from. So you guys ask me about property taxes? Look at your easement rights. Which begs the question, what can I do about it? How do I get out of the easement rights? Well, if you own some property with somebody else and you go to that other person and say, hey, can you give up your property rights so I can have all of them exclusively? What's the person going to say? Probably no. Or you can buy them from me, maybe. That's the same thing with easement rights. Okay, These are property rights. So we actually have a remedy. We can actually go to the court. When there's a misuse of an easement right, we can go to the court. We can also go to the court. I'm not saying court is a solution for a lot of things. I'm just saying this is the process, okay? Think about this. Property rights, government intrusions, things you guys don't like that happen in your daily lives, look at the easement rights. Ask yourself, what easement rights gave rise to this? Now, sometimes there won't be any. I'm just saying. Let's look at property taxes. So look at all these things. You can actually petition the court to vacate an easement right. You can try to negotiate that with whoever has the easement right. You could just say, I don't want uh, a water hookup anymore. I don't want, want water service. My neighbor does, but I don't. So I want, your, um, I want you to remove your, your piping underground, and then I want you to seal off right at the border of where your piping goes into my land, I want that sealed off, and then I want to amend or vacate the um, the easement rights that gave rise to that. And so, what the let's say the um, the county or whoever is providing you the water, let's say that someone agrees with you, you would probably have to pay for that. No problem. I mean, it, the option's there, right? But let's say there's an abuse of it. Like here's an example. Let's say um, you're forcibly uh, 
told unilaterally that you have to agree to a smart meter, right? And you don't like that. Why didn't you like a smart meter? Well, there's no um, there's no battery backup. There's no safety uh, equipment that, that's included with it because uh, that would protect you from radiation, for example. Moreover, that the smart meter we can show that it's collecting your private data. It's really an invasion of privacy, among other things. And so and pr privacy is a property right, it, aside from land. This is another issue, too, because going back to my example of the, the actual example of being stopped by the sheriff's deputy, not only was there an easement right and a property right issue, but I had property rights that were violated. I had the right to be using a public right of way, unimpeded, with without being harassed as long as I wasn't posing a risk to public safety right and so again this goes back to what he why you know when, when he first stopped me he said he, he said I was swerving so they always have this you know cover this cover story to try to get their way in so you can petition to vacate an easement you can probably modify or amend an easement I've never done this before I'm just telling you guys this uh, experience just prompted me to talk more about it because a lot of you have asked me about about the property taxes and you've asked me about setting up um, let's call it townships or um, venues that are outside of the county that are off the tax rules and I'm not saying that's my objective I'm, I'll share it with you and yeah I want to do that too um, but what I've done over the years is just tell people or show them how to offset their property tax liability with just some sort of cash flow or some way to reallocate something right but what I'm telling you now is why not if we're going to talk about PMAs and you're going to be educated on this and you're motivated, why not talk about the whole thing? Let's just talk about easements, okay? And and the process and and this is a property right. And if you can't negotiate a change or a way out of it, you could petition the court and show good cause why it should be amended or vacated. Okay? Petition to vacate, there's an encroachment. So, <clears throat> I believe encroachment is a cause of action in itself. Trespass may be a similar cause of action. I don't know what the pleading requirements are. So we can talk about that. I would think that you can petition to vacate uh, an easement right is a cause of action, okay? And also to modify, I would imagine, is a cause of action. Meaning a cause of action means basically you have a right to sue. You have a private right to go to the court and ask for a remedy, okay? It's injunctive relief, so don't, you're not, it's not a tort claim. It's to get an order from the court getting something done that otherwise you couldn't agree on, okay? All right, so I, I have, as you can imagine, lots of uh, different points here. So I don't want to. So I gave you a couple examples here, right? So, um, yeah, I, I went over those already. So another thing to consider is, um, so an agency of the government has a compelling interest when it has a duty to act. The duty to act usually comes from public safety or keeping the peace, an obligation to keep the peace, or some other chartered responsibility. Okay. If it's not acting to fulfill some obligation, then it's acting outside of its charter. It may constitute an encroachment of its easement rights. Okay, is this starting to come together now? So the PMA is going to get us there for a large part of the situation. It's going to get us there, probably all, all the way, most of the time, okay? But realize you still have this underlying issue of easement rights, okay? We don't really talk about that. But we should. Let's do this right, okay? Let's look at this stuff. So a compelling interest is created with evidence of some sort of legal violation, a safety issue, right? Uh, if there's legal authority to do something. Uh, you know, and you will find the easement rights, like I said, in a survey. Just like a survey was done to establish the, the meets and bounds or the perimeter of your property, okay? that will be in public records. And by the way, airspace is a property right. The air above your house is a property right. And right now the, uh, the Federal Aviation Authority, and the FCC for that matter, uses your airspace because you don't. <laughs> and it makes sense, but really the airspace is a land right and it should be held in trust for people. And while we fly you know, commercial airlines, we're paying for that, but that cost should be offset by a tax credit, let's say, or something. But they, I don't think that's even factored into anything. I think that that's just 
I think our land rights in the air are regarded as abandoned property rights. But I wanted to share that concept with you because this is really an interesting subject and we, and we should understand this. You know, just like I had talked to you before, I mean, everything I deal with has to do with changing someone's property rights so he can avoid a risk or manage a risk more effectively. So this is all I'm, I'm doing. I'm just showing you something more. I'm just showing you a little bit more above and beyond this talk about PMA. It's becoming trendy, as my children would say. And then they would laugh and say, that's, uh, that's stupid because it's trendy. But it is. It's trendy. Everybody wants to talk about the PMA. Okay? The PMA. I, I've been using that since the 90s, and, and here's the way I do it. As you know, I use a PMA or some type of unincorporated organization, a trust sometimes. Sometimes I use a group. Like, for example, I might use two or three people that are working together in a project on an LLC registration, and those three individuals that I name in the articles, one, two, three, I specifically name them in the articles, that is a PMA. I just didn't put that in the document. Okay? So I'm using that organization or that structure to change the property rights so that a person who would normally have a liability with respect to a property right now has divested that property right into a group of two or more people, including himself or not. It doesn't really matter. He's put that property right over here so he can still use the property right, but he's not liable for it. That's everything. That's everything. So take this back to understanding easements. It's a property right. And how can we modify that? Well, let's recognize where the liability is first. Always go into where's the liability coming from. Like we talk a lot about uh, using an SSN and getting a 1099. Those in themselves don't create tax liabilities. It's what you, what you, what you report under oath to the government. That creates a tax liability, right? All right, so let's give an example. I'm not saying this. you should go off and do this. I just want to give you something to think about. So here's an example of a traffic citation. So we've, we've all gotten them. Uh, speeding ticket, right? Uh, I love speeding ticket example. Okay. So, so let's say uh, you want to ask, you get the ticket and you have your arraignment date and you have rules in the procedure if you want to look it up. So the rules allow discovery. So the state has a burden of proof in a speeding ticket case. And so you can ask for discovery. What the heck do you ask for? Well, one of the things you can ask for is the charging instrument. That's a kind of a different subject. But another thing you can ask for is what easement rights are documented that allow the sheriff's deputy or the police officer to monitor that public right of way for people exceeding the posted speed limit and then issue a citation imposing a fine for exceeding that speed limit. What easement right gave that authority to the police officer? And I would just love to see the prosecutor come up with that record. <laughs> that would be a very interesting because if they can't, within the time limit, you know, because you're, you were looking at, uh, what, three months maybe for a traffic ticket, uh, and I would ask for dismissal, okay? for lack of jurisdiction. Forget the Constitution. I'm talking about an easement right. I think this is way easier to argue, but let's just say, so we, we get into that and then um, describe the public safety obligation or duty to keep the peace or describe if there was any maintenance of public property, right, going on at that time. No, there's not. Uh, you, you were allegedly speeding, exceeding the speed limit, and it was allegedly unsafe. Now, there's an interesting case. Uh, so was there a duty to act? So first, ask about the easement rights. You might be surprised. They'll probably dig it up and say, yep, we sure do. We have the right over public safety issues. And that right is further expressed in statutes and administrative regulations. OK, can't argue with that one. But why not make them prove it? <laughs> ask them. Um, but there again, there's a case called Gibson versus Boyle. This is a, a Supreme Court decision. Uh, it, 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 I believe it, was, it came out of Arizona a long time ago. Not too long ago, but and it was based on another uh, Supreme Court decision. Uh, it was in Arizona called State versus Rich. But anyways, in Gibson versus Boyle, the holding of the case was that a, a person was speeding. Now, it's a complex case. I believe it was involved manslaughter or some, some ugly thing that went on there. But basically, the holding of the court was that while someone was exceeding the speed limit, if the speed even though it was beyond the posted limit, 
if it was reasonable and prudent under the circumstances, in other words, there was no safety risk, then there's no violation and therefore the fine cannot be and should not be imposed. Check that out. Gibson versus B-O-Y-L-E. Okay, and State versus Rich. This is what I've been telling you guys. It's about compelling interest. A lot of times we can get rid of compelling interest by changing property rights. Now you're not going to do that with a speeding ticket. If you're going too fast, you're going too fast. Okay. If someone can document it and have evidence, okay then. But like in Florida, if you go 25 miles per hour over the posted speed limit or more, it's considered a crime. But if you're 20 miles per hour or 24 miles per hour over the speed limit, it's still a civil infraction. Likely that's going too fast, more than likely. So we have to be responsible there. In many states, going 20 miles per hour over the speed limit or more is a crime. So in that case, there would be a public safety issue and you will not, you will not be successful arguing Gibson versus Boyle or compelling interest because you were going so damn fast, they had to stop you, okay? So there are limits to this if you give them compelling interest, okay? But I believe compelling interest in this matter, for example, the traffic citation for speeding, I believe that originates with easement rights. Private property owners gave an easement right to an organization that we funded, we insured, we trained, we supply with you know re regular revenue through taxation, and we say, you can travel through our property and, and, in an unencumbered way as long as you serve the public interest by protecting people and, and keep people safe, okay? Public safety. But if you don't do that, you're, you're then encroaching upon an easement right we gave you or you're trespassing, okay? So anyways, I hope that to give you some information, I know there's gonna be a lot of questions from this and that's fine, we can do a, we can do a live uh, Q&A and I'll be more than happy to answer. So how does this factor in uh, to the PMA and taxes and things like that? Uh, again, I, I, it's about, changing property rights and then sometimes it doesn't work, right? This is why I want to talk about this because you do have this underlying issue with easement rights, okay? It's not always about income taxes. I mean, all of us are talking about income taxes. That's 99% of the conversations I have with everyone is about income taxes and you're not going to deal with that understanding easement rights. But what you can understand is that easement rights give rise to what a lot of the problems we're experiencing. Uh, you know, intrusion by government agencies and things like that. And then you've got this PMA thing going on. Understand that a PMA has to operate as a PMA. You're, you really be, have to be a PMA. That, and I have case law on this. I can send you a brief uh, if you want to look it up. You can also look it for yourself. You, there's all kinds of research out there. There's, there's, there's case law uh, that you can use. Uh, but basically, you operate as a PMA you put the proper signs up and you can document a PMA. I will make the least changes to your organization. If I'm working with your, your business, I will read your published policies first. I will find out what the customer sees. Um, and then I will maybe add some paragraphs or modify a couple of things so that you have consideration toward operating as a PMA. But the most important thing is that you're doing that apparently, okay? then you still have the easement rights. So once you get to that PMA and you have that understanding, you really should go get the easement rights for the property or the premises that's relating to what you're trying to do. I think that would give you a real leg up on any situations that, that come up. All right? I hope this is relevant to a lot of you guys and what your situations are. Um, I want to just leave you with this. I mean, I made a note here. I think I missed it. But you have to realize that we are the government, okay? We are the government. So if you want to criticize government agents, okay, and we, we should be doing that, I mean, you know, but this is our society. We are the government and um, you can't change that. You, you, can, you can elect people and all these things, but ultimately we are the government. And, and when our government, the people we elected uh, or presumably elected, don't do what they're supposed to do or, or, they're, or they're causing problems or they're abusive or they're exceeding their, their power, ultimately we have to clean up the mess. It's on us. And we're gonna, you know, we, we, we have to be responsible. It's just like a family. You can't change a family. A family is, by definition, what a family is. And you can say that, you know, you're in the family or not, but naturally you're in the family if you're in the family, right? So you cannot change the nature of the existence of a family or an association 
uh, if there truly is an association. Just like um, another example of an association would be uh, everyone who lives in your neighborhood, right? They're part of an association of people who live in your neighborhood. Or how about all the people that uh, that are right-handed? Okay, they're members of an association of all the people that are right-handed. It's silly, it sounds, but this is how simple it is, okay? What we do with that understanding is how we can be effective at solving problems. And I always lead back to this thing. It's property rights. Property rights give us the liability, but they can also give us the protection if we are clever and we do the right thing. So thanks for watching. Hope you guys like it.